Hello, uh, I'm Michael Eggleston. Uh, I'm in Professor Ming Wu's group here at UC Berkeley. Uh, and as mentioned, I'll be discussing a waveguide integrated optical antenna nano LEDs uh, for on chip optical communication. Uh, so, just a short background. Um, we've been talking a lot about larger systems, um, also optical interconnects off chip. Uh, more of what I kind of want to talk about is actually using optical communication on a chip. So if we look at modern CPUs, about 50 to 80 percent of the total power dissipation is actually in these uh, metal wire interconnect layers. Uh, and if we ask ourselves why that is, um, if we want to send a bit of information from one transistor to another, uh, we have to charge up the, the metal wire connecting them. Uh, wires have a kind of a, a lower bound of capacitance of about uh, two picofarads per centimeter. So if you want to send one uh, bit of information across a one centimeter chip, that's going to cost you about two picojoules. Now, if we could somehow use optics instead of wires, um, kind of more of this uh, IBM concept drawing where we have the optics sitting on top of our uh, processor and memory layer, um, theoretically, the amount of energy we need to send a bit of information uh, is just the amount of energy required to create those photons. Uh, so for signaling with maybe 0.8 EV photons, uh, we want a good signal noise ratio, so we'll send maybe, send maybe uh, 17 photons per bit. We're talking about two attojoules. So obviously this is kind of optimistic. This is uh, six orders of magnitude lower uh, than what wires can do. But uh, really to reach this level, what we need is a, a very efficient emitter. So you might think, well, maybe we can use a semiconductor laser to do this. Uh, well, semiconductor lasers, first of all, they tend to be quite large. Even if you could scale it down, even if you could scale down the threshold current uh, drastically, maybe get uh, a one microamp threshold, uh, you still need to bias the laser uh, well above threshold to get a fast speed. So if you wanted a 10 gigabit uh, laser, you're probably going to be, even at one microamp threshold, uh, you're still talking at least 400 attojoules per bit, uh, well, well above what this theoretical limit is. Now, on the other hand, if we use uh, optical antenna enhanced nano LED, on the other hand, uh, there's no bias current. Uh, by using an optical antenna to enhance the spontaneous emission rate of an LED, uh, we can get very large bandwidths of 10 to hundreds of gigahertz, possibly, uh, while only consuming uh, energy about the order of magnitude of the photons that we're creating. Now, we have uh, demonstrated this type of device before. Uh, last year at ISLC, it uh, consists of a ridge of indium gallium arsenide phosphide, uh, and we coat it with a uh, bar of gold. And now what this acts as is a, a dipole antenna surrounding the emitter uh, with this arch over the top that we can use to uh, kind of tune the parameters of this antenna. Uh, now a very simple uh, model will uh, estimate a spontaneous emission enhancement ratio proportional to the length of the antenna divided by the gap spacing uh, squared. So for the typical antennas we're making, they're about 400 nanometers long, uh, 35 nanometer gap, uh, we usually expect about a 33x enhancement in the spontaneous emission rate. Uh, so this is actually a, a schematic of a structure we've actually made. It's the gold antenna with the in-gas bridge. Uh, and what we do is we embed it in epoxy and completely remove the substrate. And what this allows us to do is actually measure the optical properties of this emitter uh, without complications from uh, light trapping in the high-index substrate. So if we look at just a bare ridge of in-gas uh, and we compare it to one that's coated with an optical antenna, uh, we see this huge increase, 35x, in the amount of light coming out of these devices. Uh, and the reason for this is because we're getting a corresponding increase in the spontaneous emission rate. So uh, there's a 35x increase in the efficiency of these devices. So this is pretty promising. Uh, we're getting a speed up, better efficiency, very, very nanoscale device. Um, but right now it's just coupled into free space. If you really want to communicate on a chip, uh, you're going to want to you know, route these optical signals through waveguides. So can we do this? Uh, well, the simplest waveguide I could think of is just uh, putting the antenna structure on an indium phosphide substrate. Uh, so most of the light is going to be radiated into the substrate. Um, and as most people who work with LEDs know, most of that light will actually be trapped. Now, normally this is a bad thing in LEDs. You don't want light trapped in your substrate. Uh, but we can actually use this. Uh, we, can use, we can use this high index substrate, uh, sculpt it into a waveguide, um, as shown here, about 200 nanometers thick. Uh, and now the light is trapped in the waveguide and actually gets coupled in and travels along the waveguide. Uh, so for this kind of first order structure, we're getting in simulations about 28% of the light uh, actually coupled into the power 
Uh, not that great. Still about 70% just lost the free space. Uh, so we can start playing around with the dimensions of the waveguide. Uh, if we make, make it a little thicker, uh, we can effectively think of it as a kind of a single layer DBR. So we have light going up and light going down. And if we tune the thickness of this, we can destructively interfere light going down and light going up. And that results in more light coupled into the waveguide. Uh, simulations show us we can get 50% of the light coupled in this way. Uh, we can go one step further, uh, and we can use a Yagi Uda uh, antenna structure, as you might be familiar with as, uh, with your TV antenna, or what used to be TV antenna back in the analog days. Uh, and now what this Yagi Uda antenna structure does uh, is you have your active element with your in-gas, and you have a passive reflector and director. Now this creates an in-plane uh, emission pattern, which couples very well to a planar waveguide, uh, and it also has directivity. Uh, with simulation showing you get 50% of the power coupled into the forward direction of the waveguide uh, with over 65% of the total light uh, emitted into the waveguide. So we thought this looked pretty promising, so we went ahead and fabricated it. Uh, we start with an indium phosphide substrate with an epi layer. Uh, we pattern indium phosphide waveguides. Uh, and then on top, we wet etch this in gas into a small ridge and deposit an antenna. Uh, the entire structure is then... Uh, bonded to a carrier substrate, and the substrate is uh, the high index substrate is removed. Uh, and what you're left with uh, are indium phosphide waveguides. With at the very center, uh, we have this tiny little uh, arch antenna nano LED. Uh, and with this, we can go ahead and start uh, characterizing the emission of this. Uh, so what we do is we take the structure, uh, we pump it from the bottom with a femtosecond laser pulse. Uh, this injects carriers into the ridge, which then recombine. Uh, and we use another objective to collect the radiated light, uh, and we look at it on a CCD. So a typical test structure consists of a single uh, antenna on a 50 micron waveguide. Uh, and first thing we do is look at the total amount of light coming out. So we can see for just a bare ridge, uh, we don't see much light. And when we add antennas, we get this huge increase uh, in emitted light because we're enhancing the spontaneous emission rate. Um, now, this 12x isn't as good as what I'd previously shown you, but for these structures, we were more focused on coupling, uh, and we didn't really aggressively scale these gaps down. Uh, now, the really interesting result is when you look at where on the chip this light is coming from. Uh, so a very simplified cartoon here of our antenna. Uh, and the cross-section of the waveguide. So the light from the antenna can either come straight out into free space or can be coupled into the waveguide, travel down to the end, and be scattered out. So if we look at just a bare ridge sitting on a waveguide, we see a peak of light coming from the center of the waveguide, and then 25 microns to either side, we see another blip of light uh, from the light that's traveled down and is coupled out the ends. Uh, when we put on this antenna, we get this huge increase uh, of light, uh, but still about 50% is coupled. We're not really changing the radiation pattern. Uh, now when we put the Yagyu antenna structure on here, uh, we now have a much more planar emission. Our coupling increases drastically, uh, quite a bit, uh, and 70% of the total emitted light is now uh, coupled into this waveguide, and it's actually directional now. You have more light going one way than the other, uh, with our best structure soaring a 3 to 1 front to back emission ratios. So this is pretty good as it is, uh, but it would be nice to actually make a circuit out of it. Um, indium phosphide isn't the easiest thing to work with, especially in large scale. Uh, so we've developed a process to transfer this 3.5 onto silicon substrates. Uh, so we take a 3.5 epi layer, uh, we bond it to a temporary carrier, uh, remove the substrate, and then put the 3.5 layer down on silicon. Uh, and here we have a cleave cross-section showing uh, indium phosphide and in-gas uh, epi layers sitting directly on this silicon substrate. Uh, now we can take this in large silicon wafers, uh, do processing, and actually make uh, large-scale optical circuits. Uh, this, so this shows a first run of this process where we just have these uh, uh, waveguide test structures. All of the white here you see is actually a 3.5 material, um, and the black here is the silicon underneath that doesn't have 3.5 on it. Uh, so basically, these are all uh, silicon waveguides with 3.5 material directly on top, which will allow us to actually make these devices directly in a silicon photonics platform and create large-scale optical circuits. Uh, so in summary, I've demonstrated a, a nano LED with enhanced spontaneous emission uh, with 70% of the light coupled into the waveguide, 50% um, forward coupling and directional emission. 
And in the future, uh, we're going to be leveraging silicon photonics platforms to integrate this nano LED in large uh, scale optical circuits. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, E3S and AFSR for their financial support. Comments and questions? Uh, what kind of quantum efficiency was it? So it was 35 times higher than something, but... Yeah, so right now we're using the, the quantum efficiency to, to characterize the speed up. Uh, so you actually want a bad quantum efficiency to start with. So we don't passivate the surface. Uh, we actually make the surface a little worse while processing it. Uh, so our quantum efficiency starts out at maybe 10 to the minus 4. Um, and so the way to, to bring that up is you work on both ends. You make the surfaces better and you enhance the spontaneous emission. And that can get you back up into the, the tens of percent. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Have you considered any uh, designs for electrically pumped systems? Yes. So we, we do. Uh, we are, uh, I guess, aggressively going towards electrical injection right now. Um, I guess if I go back to the structure, there's two uh, main ways you could probably think of to inject this. Uh, and one would be uh, kind of the more traditional approach with a, where you leave the substrate on and you could use the antenna as one uh, electrode and then the substrate as another and inject carriers directly from the top. Um, on the other hand, uh, this is actually basically a fin-fed transistor structure uh, where the antenna takes the place of the gate. Uh, this is the channel, and you can imagine on one side you have a P contact and on the other side an N contact. And so these, these are strategies we're going towards right now. Uh, hello. Here. Uh, I have a question regarding the 35 mm -hmm. uh, times enhancement. Yeah. Uh, what is the – you basically alluded – this entire 35% enhancement is due to the enhancement of your uh, lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, which means you're implying the coupling coefficient remain the same. Yep. Uh, so I, 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 I'm not sure that's correct. I, yes. I think you actually enhance the coupling of the light into your uh, active region, also enhance the coupling out of the active region. So uh, what is so that you, the enhancement factor? Are you, are you talking about the, the pumping strength? For example, yeah, for example yeah. if you don't have the antenna, mm -hmm. and then the average uh, incident power will be, I don't know, I'm just coming with a number, let's say one uh, yeah, yeah. megawatt oh. per centimeter square, but with the antenna, mm -hmm. it's in effectively enhanced by, let's say, 100 times. So that, that's a very good point. Uh, and that is something you have to take very careful measures to uh, avoid when doing these measurements. Uh, but one thing you can leverage is the antenna actually only responds in this polarization. Uh, so when we pump these structures, we pump them all in the orthogonal direction. So regardless of whether there's an antenna there or not, they see the same amount of uh, electric field within the, the ridge. Well, there is a plasmonic possibility for plasmonic uh, excitation when you excite uh, your antenna with the polarization perpendicular to so, the antenna direction. Uh, you, you're definitely correct. There, there is uh, a possibility of that. Uh, but at the scales that we have, uh, we're nowhere near one of those resonances that would give you any enhancement. So, so you did the calculation oh, yes, and yes, then we, found out the enhancement was nearly zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and another thing you can do uh, that we've done is you can uh, sweep the, the pump wavelength. So we, we've swept it between 600 nanometers and 1,100, uh, and we get the same amount of power out. So the, the pump wavelength's not really sensitive. Or it's not sensitive to the pump wavelength, uh, only really the polarization. So. Very interesting. And can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. Where you actually spatially mapped the uh, emission, mm -hmm. uh, when you have the antenna on top, uh, did the antenna block some of those light? Yes. So that, that is actually a, a, another very uh, a good question. So uh, when you flip this over, yeah, you can imagine you're, you're pumping it uh, slightly different. Uh, so the trick is... Uh, when you do this spatial map, you actually don't need to scan around. Uh, so if you have the exact same objective here and here, uh, you can keep the pumping the same. And then when you flip the sample over, you pump from the top and collect from the top. And that way your pumping stays constant throughout, both when you do the top side and the back side uh, collection, if that makes sense. So basically you're exciting and collecting from the same side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That concludes the session. Thank you. So
So I'd like to uh, thank uh, everyone for uh, coming uh, to uh, the third Berkeley Symposium on Energy Efficient Electronic Systems. I especially like to thank everybody here because you stayed to the very end. Uh, and I think you'll, you'll agree the session, the last session, was just as interesting as the uh, first session. Uh, the, uh, uh, I would say that uh, this is the best of the three that we've done. They get better each time. And uh, this is because of uh, the excellent speakers, so I'd like to especially thank uh, the speakers for uh, being extremely uh, interesting, fascinating, uh, presenting uh, new material and uh, getting us all excited. So, uh, well, uh, when are we going to have our next one? Uh, we're not sure. We've been doing it every uh, 24 months or so. And if there's a tremendous groundswell of support, maybe we'll, uh, uh, we'll have our uh, next symposium uh, a little bit sooner. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the success of the symposium has been largely due to the people here. So give yourselves a hand of applause. And we're done. <laughs>